first, I really just want to welcome everybody and really thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Taylor. I am the Curriculum Design and Training Specialist here at Arizona State University's Office of Community Health Engagement and Resiliency. We go by OCHER for short. Our goal here at OCHER is to co-create interventions with communities that focus on inherent strengths and promote resiliency. So we provide trainings, webinars, and technical assistance on evidence-based and trauma-informed practices and interventions for community health workers. Um, before we get started and um, I start to introduce our presenter today, we wanted to first acknowledge and honor the original caretakers of the land that ASU resides on by sharing this video that's created by ASU's Alliance of Indigenous Peoples. So this is a student-led group that serves to represent and unite any and all self-identifying Indigenous voices at ASU. University is located in Indian Country. There are 22 tribal nations in Arizona. ASU's campuses are situated on the homelands of many indigenous peoples, including the Akamal Atam and Peeposh. Arizona State University recognizes the original inhabitants of these lands and recognizes that they still reside throughout the Phoenix metropolitan area. And we recognize the impact of their wisdom and generosity towards us. If you've flown into the valley, you have undoubtedly seen the Salt River Project canals that surround the area. Those modern day canals follow the framework of the canals originally constructed by ancestral Sonoran desert people who will come to make this area both livable and a place where peoples could thrive. We acknowledge that the modern day indigenous nations that descended from the ancestral peoples are the original inhabitants of this land. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box, which you can find below in your Zoom control panel. We'll make sure that all of your questions get answered by the end of the presentation. Um, for any other comments or engaging with our presenter today, please use the chat function. Um, we're also happy to share that we do have live Spanish language interpretation that is brought to you by the Tucson Language Justice Collective and our two amazing interpreters, Madi and Maria. If you would like to use the Spanish channel, please click on the interpretation button at the bottom of the control panel, um, which is at the bottom of your screen, and then just select Spanish. So I do want to just introduce our presenter. Um, so our presenter today is Monica Fozzi Bryant. She is a cancer rights attorney, speaker, and author dedicated to improving access to quality information on healthcare-related issues. She is the co-founder and chief operating officer for Triage Cancer, 
a national nonprofit organization that provides education on the practical and legal issues that may impact individuals diagnosed with cancer and their caregivers. So without further ado, we will go ahead and turn the time over to Monica. Thank you so much, Taylor, and thank you to all of you for joining today to talk a little bit about minimizing financial toxicity and the role that community health workers can play in helping patients avoid the financial burden that comes after a chronic or serious medical diagnosis. As Taylor mentioned, I am co-founder of an organization named Triage Cancer. And we are a national nonprofit that provides free education on all of the legal and practical issues that come up. Over the many years of doing this, what we learned was that these issues were not unique to individuals with cancer. And that questions about things like health insurance and employment rights and disability insurance came up after many different types of serious medical diagnoses. But people often were uh, turned off, so to speak, from using our organization's free resources because of the word cancer. So we recently launched a program called Triage Health, where we are providing all of this information for free without the word cancer attached to it. So today I'm going to talk about some of these practical and legal issues, and I'm going to point you back to resources, but know that many of the resources exist under both the umbrella of triage health and triage cancer. But certainly anyone is welcome to use the triage cancer versions as well. When I tell people that I'm a cancer rights attorney, they often are a little bit confused, um, and I get questions about, well, what's that? What is, uh, you know, what is legal about health or what is legal about cancer? And my answer is almost everything from what drugs that we have access to treat medical conditions to what insurance companies have to cover to what our employers are required to do and everything in between. And so when people say to me, what's legal about health? My answer is everything. So we're going to just provide an introduction today of some of the most common topics, but I point this out because you may be interacting with people in your communities that have questions about some of these other legal topics, and I want you to know that we have support for you in those areas. Now at Triage Cancer, we have a program we, where we provide direct one-on-one -on -one assistance to individuals who have been diagnosed, caregivers, and we provide technical assistance to healthcare providers. And that includes nurses, social workers, uh, patient advocates, and community health workers. And across the almost 11 years of doing this work as triage cancer, the common issue areas don't change. Overwhelmingly, the number one issue that people are coming to talk to us about is around health insurance. The next issue is certainly around financial assistance, but what we know to be true is that many times, if we can address some of these other areas of support, the financial assistance that they could be eligible for could move further or go further. So I'd like to introduce you to Martha. Martha is a 35-year-old single mom to Vinny, who's three. Martha has insurance through work, but went to a free mammogram event and was diagnosed with breast cancer. She quit her job as a hairstylist because she believed she would not be able to keep up with her treatment on top of everything else she was doing, and her former employer didn't like it when Silas asked for time off. She has about $2,000 saved up, but once that's gone, she's not going to be able to pay her bills or feed herself or Vinny. She's also concerned that if she doesn't pay rent, she's going to be evicted. Martha has some very generous friends who have offered to set up a GoFundMe campaign, but she's not really sure if she should agree to it or not. Medical bills related to the diagnostic testing have started to come in, but she knows that the biggest medical bill will be for surgery. And without insurance, she's not sure she can find a surgeon to help her. 
Martha has never applied for government benefits and doesn't even really know where to start. She lives in Indiana with Vinny. Uh, she also mentions to you that Vinny's dad pays child support sporadically, but it never amounts to much. She thinks her treatment will last about 18 months, and she's not able to be a stylist and doesn't really think she could do anything else either. She's also concerned about who will help her after her surgery and who will provide care for Vinny. Her mom may be able to help out, but she has to work too. She thinks that maybe money was taken out of her check for Social Security, but she's not really sure how much or how to find out. This, I'm venturing to guess, sounds at least somewhat familiar to many of the people that you might be working with. It's certainly a person that we may speak to. And really, she sets up our conversation for today. Now, when we're in person and I get to actually see you, I often will ask people, you know, who's ever put together one of those thousand piece jigsaw puzzles? And I think it's become more popular since COVID. But then I would ask, well, who's ever tried to do it without seeing the picture on the box of what the puzzle is supposed to look like? And that's what it can feel like to a lot of people who have never had to navigate the healthcare system or employment rights or government benefits. And then they're thrown into a serious medical condition and they don't really understand what the full picture is supposed to look like. It's incredibly overwhelming. Now, we're gonna talk today about the different puzzle pieces that someone might have access to, but keep in mind that no two people's puzzle is ever gonna look exactly the same. So when I'm talking about puzzle pieces, I'm talking about potentially the federal laws and programs that might be available to someone. I'm talking about the state laws and programs that might be available to someone. Certainly what is available through an employer is going to be different from person to person. And then we're gonna look at what type of insurance coverage someone might have. And certainly that could just be about health insurance, but it, there's other types of insurance that might be helpful like disability insurance or supplemental insurance. And then finally, we're gonna need to look at what the piece is around finances and medical bills and financial assistance. So the title of this presentation is around how CHWs can be helpful in helping people avoid financial toxicity. And that's a term that was coined by researchers out of Duke University in 2013. And they looked at how the financial burden or impact of a cancer diagnosis can be as significant as the physical burden or toxicity of cancer treatment and how it's almost sometimes worse than the physical components. But what was really important about this research was they didn't just look at how this financial toxicity happens in an acute way during active treatment, but how there is often a long-term impact long after active treatment. And while, yes, certainly this research looked specifically at cancer treatment, what we're seeing to be true 10 years later is that this financial toxicity shows up in lots of different serious medical, serious and chronic medical conditions. So we're 10 years into having this term. Why is it so hard to address the financial toxicity of serious medical conditions? In our opinion, it's because there are multiple contributing factors. And if we as a healthcare system aren't addressing all, or at least most of those contributing factors, we're never going to be able to effectively help people avoid the financial burden. The number one most significant contributing factor is health insurance status. Now, I will tell you that could mean not having health insurance at all. But more often, it's about not having the right health insurance for them or not knowing how to effectively use those policies. The next most significant contributing factor is employment changes. So certainly those could mean changes for the person who's been diagnosed, but it could also be about employment changes for someone acting as a caregiver. And how does that overall change the finan family's financial health? 
And then all of the things that normally impact our finances in life, relationship changes, moving, leaving school, all those things keep happening even after getting a serious medical diagnosis. And so again, we need to start thinking about how do we help people address all of these different factors to effectively help them avoid the financial toxicity. One of the challenges is our health insurance system is confusing. In fact, 96% of Americans don't understand health insurance. So if we don't even understand the words that we're using in a health insurance policy, how can we expect people to be good consumers of health insurance? And so I'm gonna talk through the four or five most commonly used health insurance terms. I certainly appreciate some of you may know these very well, but you may be in the position of having to explain what these different terms are to the people you're working with. So this might be able to give you some suggested language. So when we're talking about health insurance costs, every single month, we have to pay a premium. A premium is your fixed dollar amount that you're going to pay every single month, whether someone goes to the doctor or not. It's like having car insurance all year, but never getting into an accident. But then there are some other costs when you actually go and use your health care. The first is your annual deductible. That's a fixed dollar amount that you have to pay out of pocket before your health insurance kicks in. You could have a plan with a $500 deductible or a $5,000 deductible. It just depends on the plan. But you have to pay that out of pocket before your health insurance kicks in. Once you've paid that, your insurance pays a co-insurance or a cost share. So two terms for the same thing. And this is a percentage. So for example, if you have an 80-20 plan, insurance pays 80% and you pay 20%. Most plans also have an additional payment called a copayment. This is a fixed dollar amount that you're going to pay each time you get care. And it can depend on the policy. It can also depend on the service. So it's very common for plans to have something like a $20 copayment to see the doctor, a $30 copayment to see a specialist, a $250 copayment if you end up in the ER. But one of the most important things for all of us, and I really do mean all of us because we're all consumers of healthcare, to know about our plans is the out-of-pocket maximum. This is a fixed dollar amount that is the most we are going to pay out-of-pocket for our healthcare per year. And the way that we get to that out-of-pocket maximum is a math problem. So we're gonna add up everything we pay towards our deductible, everything we pay towards our co-payments and everything we pay towards our co-insurance. So it's everything we pay except that monthly premium. So here's an example of how this could work. Meet Dan. Dan has a plan with a $2,000 deductible. It's an 80-20 co-insurance and has an $8,000 out-of-pocket maximum. Now Dan hasn't used any medical care in the year yet, but he gets into an accident and ends up with a $102,000 hospital bill. So how much does Dan have to pay for that? First, we always have to pay our deductible. So he pays his $2,000, so that leaves $100,000 left of the bill. Because he's met his deductible, now coinsurance kicks in, insurance pays 80%, and he's responsible for 20%. 20% of $100,000 is $20,000. But how much of that $20,000 does Dan actually have to pay? Go ahead and throw it in the chat box if you have an idea. So we have one, one guess for 8,000. Any other thoughts? 
It's actually 6,000. And here's why. His plan has a total out-of-pocket maximum of $8,000. He's already paid $2,000 towards his deductible, which leaves another $6,000 left to meet the out-of-pocket maximum. And then insurance picks up the rest. Now, I am not by any means suggesting that $8,000 isn't a lot of money. Of course it is. But when we start looking at the alternatives of what he would have to pay without the out-of-pocket maximum, which would be $20,000, or certainly what he would pay without insurance, which would be $102,000, $8,000 starts to feel a little bit more reasonable. Now, if you would like to hear any of that again, or if you think that anyone you work with could benefit from learning the terms or this example, that's included in our animated video on health insurance basics. This video is available in English and Spanish and has closed captioning, and it's on our website. So please feel free to share it. Now, in the United States, there are three places where we get health insurance. About 54% of Americans get their insurance through an employer. The other Americans get their insurance through the government, primarily through Medicare and Medicaid. And then the smallest number of Americans go directly to a health insurance company to purchase health insurance. But regardless of where someone is getting their health insurance, there are two main payment systems that exist in this country. The first is called fee for service. And this is where services are unbundled and you go to a provider and you pay the provider for that service. Fee for service provides more choice uh, but there's typically fewer uh, protections on out-of-pocket expenses. Original Medicare is an example of fee-for-service. The alternative is managed care. And this is where you have all the services bundled, and it's really designed to help reduce costs and theoretically improve quality of care. When someone's in a managed care plan, though, you are in fact limited to that network of providers that the plan has chosen. So many people get coverage under the managed care umbrella, but there's a couple of different options in managed care. And again, in order to effectively shop for insurance, we have to understand the differences. So on one end of the spectrum, we have health maintenance organizations, or HMOs. These are plans with smaller networks of providers, sometimes even in one building. HMOs typically require that all care starts with a primary care physician. If the primary care physician can't solve the problem, then there's a referral out to a specialist. So with HMOs, there's less choice and there's more hoops to jump through, but in exchange, you're gonna pay less. On the other end of the spectrum are preferred provider organizations or PPOs. These are gonna have the largest network of providers, many times across different hospital systems. They're often gonna have some out of network coverage. So they won't cover if you go out of network at as high of a rate, but they'll provide some coverage. PPOs don't require starting with the primary care physician. You can go straight to the specialist. In exchange for all this choice and flexibility, you're going to pay more. And then there are lots of things in the middle. An example is an exclusive provider organization or an EPO. These are going to have larger networks compared to an HMO, but no out-of-network coverage. So you're going to pay more for an EPO than you would an HMO, for example. So with that under our belt, let's get into some details around options for people. So if someone is leaving their job, due to a serious medical condition, and they have employer-sponsored health insurance coverage, COBRA is the federal law that allows them to keep that exact same coverage when they would normally lose it. COBRA only applies to employers with 20 or more employees, 
And the benefit is it's the exact same coverage, same doctors, same drugs, everything stays the same with respect to what you've paid into that plan for the year. The downside is that it can be expensive because once someone elects COBRA, they have to pay 100% of the monthly premiums plus a 2% administrative fee. So it can feel very expensive. But we think that COBRA should still be part of the discussion when someone's losing their job or maybe aging out of their parents' policy, for example, because there are some significant benefits to COBRA. Certainly it could be the coverage is better. Maybe it's about the providers or the prescription drugs. But believe it or not, sometimes COBRA is the less expensive option. Think of a scenario where someone is uh, has already met their out-of-pocket maximum for the year and it's October. It may actually make more sense for them to elect COBRA for the last two months of the year and pay those high monthly premiums to know that all they're going to pay for the rest of the year are those monthly premiums because they've already met their out-of-pocket maximum. And then potentially next year, they could go have a different option, which we'll talk about in a minute. So it's just important to keep in mind that even though those monthly premiums can feel very, very expensive because they are, sometimes, depending on circumstances, it is still the best option for patients. Now, I mentioned that the federal law is only available to people who work for employers with 20 or more employees. So what about people who work for smaller employers? Then we're going to want to look to see if there is a state COBRA law. As you can see, the details absolutely vary state to state. But for someone who works for an employer with 2 to 19 employees, they don't have access to federal COBRA. They would only have access to state COBRA if their state had one. I will also say there are a couple of states that are actually more protective than the federal law. California is a great example of that. Now, another health insurance option that you may be familiar with is Medicaid. Medicaid is a federal program that is run by the states to provide free or low cost health insurance coverage to individuals if they meet a certain eligibility. One of the reasons it's so hard to talk about Medicaid to a national audience like you all is that there is huge differences from state to state because states get to kind of customize their program all the way down to the name of Medicaid in your state. So as you can see, Arizona has a very lengthy name. Lots of states use Medicaid. California uses Medi-Cal. So believe it or not, we talk to people who don't even realize that the insurance coverage they have is Medicaid because of what it is called. So we've already confused people and caused challenges here. The other challenge is that although we talk about Medicaid as if it is one program, the reality is it's actually a lot of different programs. And the eligibility for the different programs differs. So prior to January 1st of 2014, in order to access the Medicaid program, someone had to have a low income and a low resource level and be able to walk through one of these doors. In the cancer community, many times it was people walking through this age-blind disabled door, which is a terrible name for a program, but I didn't come up with it. There were lots of challenges with this program because, first of all, someone who just had a low income, maybe because they could no longer work, but might have some resources, like $2,000 in a bank account, would be kicked out of Medicaid eligibility until they spent all of that money in their bank account. And sure, now they could access potentially the Medicaid program, but they didn't actually have money for basic needs. The other challenge is that this age-blind disabled program used the highest level of disability that we have in this country. So it was incredibly challenging for many people to access coverage through Medicaid. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act 
or the ACA or Obamacare, all the same thing, created a new door into the Medicaid program. And this new door was just based on income. So for people who had incomes at or below 138% of the poverty level, they could access Medicaid without any other requirement being met. No asset test, no resource test, didn't have to have a disability, just about income. Now, all the original doors still exist with the resource test and the added eligibility requirements. It's just this new door was added. Now, this new door was supposed to exist in all 50 states. We were going to start eliminating some disparities and increasing access to care. But the Supreme Court got their hands on the ACA and essentially made it voluntary for states to expand. And so this is where we are today. 39 states in DC have expanded, 11 states have not yet expanded. And all of the footnotes on the bottom are the states that ended up expanding after the original opportunity to expand. The states on the right that have not expanded represent about 3 million people who could have access to health care uh, if their state were to expand. I will also tell you that this is an opportunity, a huge opportunity for advocacy in these states because it's really up to the governor or the state legislatures to change this. Um, so it is still possible for these states to expand. Now, one question that we get pretty frequently is, well, what about non-citizens? Can they access Medicaid? And the answer is, it really depends. It depends on their status as a non-citizen. So generally, if someone is a lawful permanent resident or has some other lawful status, like an asylum seeker or a refugee, then they could potentially access Medicaid if they meet the other eligibility requirements. Many of those individuals are going to have a five-year waiting period from entering the country to be able to access if we are talking about individuals who are undocumented, it is unfortunately not a great option in most states. So there is limited Medicaid coverage for, un, for sorry, there's limited Medicaid coverage for individuals who are undocumented in emergency medical conditions, but emergency is very, very narrow. It's generally not gonna cover ongoing care for a serious medical condition like cancer. There are a handful of states that have chosen to expand Medicaid to individuals who are undocumented, but it is only a handful, uh, and we're seeing lots of changes with those programs. We have a, excuse me, we have a chart on our website that tracks the different state laws about uh, Medicaid coverage for non-citizens, if that is helpful. Now, the ACA did another really important thing in terms of, per let me step back. The ACA created a new way to purchase health insurance. When the law was passed, this was called an exchange. No one knew what that meant. We renamed them marketplaces people still don't really understand what these are. In fact, many people think that the insurance they're getting through these state marketplaces are government insurance. They are not. They are private insurance plans sold by private insurance companies. So they fall on the top of our triangle of coverage here. But then people ask me, well, if I'm buying private insurance from a private insurance company, why wouldn't I go just straight to the insurance company? Why would I buy it through the marketplace? And the reason is there are added benefits to purchasing through the marketplace. The first is around quality control. So plans have to meet a minimum standard to be sold in the marketplace. So people can be sure that they are purchasing a good product. 
The other benefit is there's a cap on the out-of-pocket maximums. Whereas if someone goes straight to an insurance company, that out-of-pocket maximum could be anything. And finally, there's some financial assistance to purchase plans in the marketplace. And there's two types of financial assistance. The first is a premium tax credit. So that's gonna reduce the amount someone pays monthly for health insurance. So if the full price was $400 based on their household size and income level, they get a $200 tax credit, they're only paying $200 for that plan. And then for some individuals, they could also have access to cost sharing subsidies or reductions. And that's gonna lower things like the deductible or the co-payments or the co-insurance. This financial help is only available if someone purchases a plan through the marketplace. If they go straight to the insurance company, they're not gonna get this financial assistance. In terms of how someone goes about enrolling, if they are purchasing through the marketplace, everyone can start at healthcare.gov. There is also a full Spanish equivalent website. Some states run their own state marketplaces. Co Covered California is an example of that. But no matter what, if you start at healthcare.gov, the first questions are about where you live. And if you put in your zip code and you uh, live in a state with their own marketplace, the system will kick you over to it. But we know not everyone has access to the internet or is technologically savvy. There are other ways to access the marketplace, including a phone number or a paper application. Excuse me. And there are places where you can get in-person help for enrolling. And so if you go to this link, put in your zip code, it'll show you all the places in the area that have people that help you enroll. Now, one thing uh, that's important to remember is sometimes people will say to me, I'm gonna find an insurance agent or a broker and I'm gonna get their help to enroll. And that's fine, except that there's very little regulation on what agents and brokers can do. And they are hired by insurance companies to sell their product. So there have been reports that show some bad behavior by some agents and brokers. And of course, there are wonderful insurance agents out there. Not everyone is misbehaving. But for people that we work with who are very concerned about making sure that they're buying the right policy for them, our suggestion to them is to use an in-person assister versus an agent or a broker, because those in-person assisters are not getting paid by the insurance company. They don't have an interest in having you pick one plan over the other. Now, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this webinar now is because now is the opportunity for most types of insurance where people can actually make changes. So if someone gets insurance through an employer, they should check with their employer to see when open enrollment is because it can vary, but generally it's going to be in the fall. Medicaid applications are accepted year round. So as soon as someone becomes eligible, they can apply and coverage will begin. For Medicare, which is the coverage for individuals over the age of 65 or people who have been receiving social security disability insurance for two or more years, is actually right now. It's between October 15th and December 7th every single year. And then Marketplace Open Enrollment is about to start and it will go from November 1st to January 15th in most states. If you are in one of those states that runs their own marketplace, they could actually have a longer open enrollment period. But Medicare plans and marketplace plans are calendar year plans. So even if someone picks a plan on the first day of open enrollment, that plan won't start until January 1st. And if someone waits until after January 1st to enroll, then it's going to further delay their access to insurance coverage. So getting enrolled sooner rather than later is better. 
One of the reasons why this is so important is because you may be working with people who have high out-of-pocket expenses or can't see the doctors they want to see or are paying a huge amount for health insurance because they went straight to an insurance company. Now is the opportunity for them to start shopping for a better plan that better meets their needs for next year. They should certainly keep coverage through the rest of this year, but then January 1st, their new coverage will start. The good news is also that the ACA recognized and other laws recognize that things don't just change for people during open enrollment. So if someone is going to have a loss of coverage or a life-changing event mid-year, maybe they've gotten divorced or they've moved to a new state or they've had a child, all of those things are life-changing events that trigger a special enrollment period. And there are special enrollment periods into marketplace plans, employer plans, and Medicare. So the good news is we have more options than we've ever had before if someone's about to lose their employer-sponsored coverage. The first option could be to elect COBRA or state COBRA to keep the exact same health insurance you had through your employer. The second option could be to start a totally new plan purchased through the marketplace via a special enrollment period. In lane two, everything will start over at zero, deductible and out-of-pocket maximum. Lane three is maybe someone's eligible for another group plan. So can they go on their spouse's plan at work? If they're under the age of 26, can they go on their parents' plan? Can they get a plan through their school? And then finally, based on circumstances, someone may be eligible for Medicaid or Medicare. But the trick with this is someone in the first 60 days has to pick a lane and stay in it. You do not get to change lanes until the next open enrollment period. And here's where this comes up. So what happens is someone is leaving their job, they're totally overwhelmed, and uh, they get, get COBRA paperwork and they sign up for COBRA. And then a few months in, they think, oh my gosh, this is so expensive. I can't pay this. Can I drop COBRA and go get a plan in the marketplace? And the answer is no, not until the next open enrollment. And you're going to need to keep COBRA through the rest of the calendar year until January 1st. So we have all these options. How do we go about comparing between the different options? I'm going to walk through an exercise, certainly to compare to marketplace plans or to compare to plans someone has through their job. Sometimes someone may want to compare between an employer plan and a marketplace plan because we don't have to keep our employer plans. Or if someone's trying to compare to Medicare Advantage plans. So here we have three different plans. We have a bronze plan with $200 a month premium, silver plan with a $275 a month premium, and a platinum plan at $400 a month. Can we tell just by looking at these numbers which plan is going to cost me the least, assuming I'm going to hit my out-of-pocket maximum? And when someone has a serious medical condition like cancer, chances are they're going to hit their out-of-pocket maximum. The answer is no. I can't do it just by looking at this. I actually have to do the math. And the way to do the math is you take the monthly premium and multiply it by 12, because that's how much we're going to pay in premiums for the year. And then you're going to add it to the out-of-pocket maximum. And when we do that for all three plans, we see here that that platinum plan ends up being thousands of dollars cheaper by the end of the year. But what we know to be true is most Americans only ever look at that monthly premium. And they get sticker shock when they see $400 a month 
think I can't possibly pay that, but they don't realize that by paying the lower monthly premium, they're going to spend thousands of dollars more. Now I will tell you, this doesn't always work out this way. You actually have to do it for every plan someone is considering. But the point here is, this provides us with some important information, whether we are working with people who have already been diagnosed, or if someone is trying to plan for a worst case scenario. Of course, cost is only one piece of the puzzle. We also have to make sure that someone has checked that the plan they choose chooses includes their providers, their doctors, their hospitals, and any prescription drugs that they might be taking. Now the marketplace does give us a tool to do this, although I will tell you it's not always perfect. So it is helpful if someone is narrowing down their plans to also double check with the providers. So going to the doctor and asking, do you take this plan? It is really helpful to use the actual plan name. Like, don't go in and say, do you take Obamacare? Because the doctor's office will say no, because there's no such thing. But to say something like, do you take Aetna Blue 400? Whatever the full name of the actual plan is. Some hospitals will also list on the website, but I still think it is helpful to speak to a human and double check. So this is a reminder that uh, you all can feel free to put questions in the Q&A box if you do have questions for me. Now, the unfortunate reality is that many times, even if people have the right health insurance for them, they may get a denial from the insurance company. The insurance company might come back and say, no, we're not going to cover that. What we all need to know as consumers is we don't have to take no for an answer. We have the right to appeal those denials in almost every type of health insurance, including Medicare and Medicaid and employer plans and individual plans. The details about appealing are different depending on the type of plan somebody has, but in every type of plan, there are at least two opportunities to appeal. For example, if someone has an individual plan they've gone and purchased themselves or a plan through their job, they're going to have an internal appeal where they go back to the insurance company and ask the insurance company to reconsider. But then if insurance comes back and still says no, then they have the opportunity to file an external appeal. And this is available in every single state. And it's an independent entity that looks at the evidence and decides if the insurance company should have covered that service. This is an added burden on families and patients for sure, but we know that about 50% of appeals are decided in favor of the patient. So when the insurance company says, no, we're not gonna cover that, about half the time, they're getting it wrong. And when we are talking about minimizing financial toxicity and helping people get the care they need, making sure insurance is paying what they're supposed to pay for is an incredibly important piece of this puzzle. But unfortunately, people don't know that they have this right. We know that of the 48 million claims that were denied in 2021, 99.9% .9 of them were never appealed. But remember, I just told you about half the time when the insurance company is saying no, they're getting it wrong. And so this appeals process is underutilized, yet so very powerful. We have lots of resources at both Triage Cancer and Triage Health to help people navigate the appeals process. Uh, including tracking forms and one of our animated videos. These are all available in English and Spanish. Uh, so if a individual comes to you and says, I need help, I can't pay these medical bills, 
first checking, well, did insurance deny it? And if they did, having that person appeal that denial is so helpful. Because if we start with, well, let's try to find financial assistance or let's put someone on a payment plan or, you know, with the hospital, for example, again, the insurance company hasn't paid what they're supposed to be paying. Unfortunately, you may come across people with other types of coverage, so it can get a little bit confusing as to what the rules are. Some common types of coverage you might come across are people with student health insurance, like through a university. Uh, the Affordable Care Act now requires that student health insurance has to comply with all of the ACA's protections, so it is actually now decent insurance. Other types of coverage may not actually be insurance, and so you may uh, come across people that are members of something called a healthcare sharing ministry. And this is where a group of people come together and they all put money into a pot and basically say, we're going to pay each other's medical expenses. We're gonna share each other's healthcare expenses. The challenge with these are they're not insurance. So the laws don't regulate them. And there's no guarantee that the healthcare sharing ministry will cover someone's expensive medical procedures. And so there's been a lot of movement lately about how do we protect people from these situations. Um, I will tell you that if you come across people who are in a healthcare sharing ministry and it's not working for them, open enrollment is coming up. They can certainly purchase insurance for next year. Another major challenge that we've been coming up against are short-term plans. These are plans that last less than a calendar year, and they are very inexpensive or cheap monthly. But when someone actually gets sick and goes to use the plan, they have very high out-of-pocket expenses. They also can exclude whole categories of care like prescription drugs, for example. None of the plans include maternity care. And so we bring these up because they have become more prevalent over the last couple of years. And sometimes people don't even realize that that's what they've purchased because it's not always obvious that what they're buying is a short-term plan. It just looks less expensive. Again, if you're working with people with one of these plans that wants comprehensive coverage, open enrollment starting soon, they could pick up a plan for next year. So switching gears out of health insurance into our second most significant contributing factor to financial toxicity is employment. What we often find is that people are battling assumptions when it comes to working and their serious medical condition. And they're battling their own assumptions that they can't work and there's nothing that can help. They're battling their employer's assumptions that there's nothing that can help. But sometimes they're even battling their healthcare professionals' assumptions. We have lots of evidence and stories for, of doctors saying things like, my patient can't work or wouldn't want to work and they should just go out on disability leave. And the problem there is, first of all, Maybe patients do want to work, maybe they need to work, and maybe they don't have access to disability insurance benefits. And so we want people to be starting from a place of first asking questions and not starting with the assumption that they cannot work. Because there are a number of places we could go to look for our health care rights including fair employment laws that provide protections against discrimination and other tools to work through treatment. There are federal and state leave laws that provide for job protected time off. And then if someone is working under a contract, either an employment contract or as a member of a union, those contracts could provide additional or different rights and benefits. But we often forget that the law is the bare minimum of what employers have to provide. And many employers are more generous than that bare minimum. 
So looking to see what the employer's policies are for that specific person can be useful. Now I mentioned fair employment laws. The most famous federal fair employment law is the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA. Many people know the ADA because of things like ramps into buildings, but Title I of the ADA did some very important things in the employment context. In order to use the ADA's protections, there are some eligibility requirements, like you have to work for a large enough employer and have a disability under the ADA's definition. If someone meets these eligibility requirements, they are entitled to a tool called a reasonable accommodation. And I've given you the big long definition here from the law, but the best way to talk about reasonable accommodations is through examples, and they can be put into three main categories. The first is about physical space. So maybe it's about moving offices or special equipment or working from a different location, like closer to where somebody's receiving treatment. Depending on somebody's job, maybe that could include working from home or another location. So for example, if someone does a job on a computer, then can they work while they're getting their infusion and not lose those hours? The second category is about schedule. And so this could be a whole lot of things too. So maybe it's changing shifts to deal with fatigue or maybe it's additional breaks or um, flexible schedule. So working four 10 hour days instead of five eight hour days. It could also be about extended leave. And then everything else kind of falls into our other bucket. So maybe it's about using technology or changing policies. So if someone is experiencing temperature sensitivity and they're cold all the time, but there's a strict dress code at work and they can't wear hats, a reasonable accommodation could be a change in that dress code policy for that one employee to be able to wear a hat. Sometimes it's about shifting responsibilities or changing jobs altogether. Now, when I talk to people about reasonable accommodations, oftentimes I get asked, well, do they have to give that to me? And the answer is yes. Employers that are bound by the ADA have to provide eligible employees with reasonable accommodations unless they can show it's an undue hardship or a direct threat, which is a very high bar for the employer to have to meet. But that doesn't mean that the employee gets whatever they want. It does have to be reasonable. And reasonable is going to depend on the type of job and what the employee is asking for. So if someone is a school bus driver, asking to telecommute probably won't be reasonable. But there are all sorts of things that exist out there to help people stay at work through treatment or return to work after treatment. I will say caregivers are not legally entitled to accommodations, but many times it can't hurt to ask because it keeps that caregiver a valuable employee and still at work and contributing to the office. In order to use the ADA, someone has to work for an employer with 15 or more employees. So again, what about those people who work for smaller employers? Then we're going to look to the state law. Does the state have a state law that provides reasonable accommodations? And what you see here is a chart. The numbers across the top show the number of employees each state law requires for the state fair employment law to apply. So if you are in Illinois, like myself, your employer only has to have one employee. If you're in California, the employer has to have five employees. If you don't see your state listed here, it means it's the same as the federal, which requires 15 or more employees. So what about situations where people need to take time off? The federal law is the Family and Medical Leave Act or the FMLA. 
And this provides the opportunity to take leave for somebody's own serious medical condition or to care for a seriously ill child, parent, or spouse. That's a pretty narrow definition of family if you ask me. So what this means is someone cannot take FMLA leave to care for a sibling or an aunt or a grandparent or a mother-in-law. It is only child, parent, or spouse. So what does the FMLA give someone? It gives someone up to 12 weeks of leave per year. And that leave is unpaid leave. But the true benefit to the FMLA is that it protects your job. Someone who is on FMLA cannot be fired or demoted while they are on FMLA. That is not true for sick time or PTO or vacation, or even if someone is taking short or long-term disability benefits. The thing that protects their job is the FMLA. We have tons of resources on the FMLA. Now the FMLA only applies to employees, sorry, employers that have 50 or more employees. So we're talking about larger entities and the employee has to have worked for the employer for at least a year. If someone doesn't meet those benefit, those eligibility requirements, the FMLA doesn't apply. And then we're gonna look to see if there are state, county or local leave laws. These can be more protective in lots of different ways, including smaller employers. Some state laws have an expanded definition of family. So if you're interested in the leave laws in your state, on our chart of state laws for taking time off, we have every state listed with more details. But I mentioned that FMLA leave, while it's job protected, doesn't protect, doesn't pay at you. And most of us can't go 12 weeks without any sort of income. That's where disability insurance can come into play. And there are a couple of different places where we might be able to access disability insurance. But generally, disability insurance is insurance that is going to pay us a portion or percentage of the income that we aren't making due to our disability. Generally speaking, it's between 60 and 80% is what someone would get from a disability insurance policy, but it really varies. So one place you can get disability insurance is through a private company. And this could be something that someone has gone out and purchased themselves, or it could be something that they get through an employer. Typically, there are short-term disability policies that can last up to you know six months to a year. Then there are long-term policies that are usually only, they only kick in after a year. A handful of states have state disability insurance options. Uh, these all vary from state to state, but if you'd like more details, if you're in one of these states, we do have a quick guide to state disability insurance that explains all of the different programs. Which brings us to our two federal programs. Both of these programs are run through the Social Security Administration. They are both long-term disability insurance programs. The first is Social Security Disability Insurance, or SSDI. The second is Supplemental Security Income, or SSI. Now, both of these have the same definition of disability, and that is that someone can no longer do their job. They, no long, they can't adjust to a new job, and they have a disability that has or is expected to last for a year or longer or result in death. So they can't do their job, they can't do any other jobs, and they have a serious disability. 
that's sort of where the similarities of the programs end. SSI or supplemental security income is based on having a low income and asset level. If someone has a low income and asset level and meets the definition of disability, then they will have access to benefits right away. There is a cap on the benefits, and I'm sorry, that's an old number. I believe it's closer to $900 at the moment, max per month. With SSI, generally in most states, someone would also have access to Medicaid for health insurance. So disability insurance is designed to help pay for non-medical expenses, and then Medicaid would cover medical expenses. SSDI is based on having worked and paid into the system over those working years. The amount that someone is going to make on SSDI is based on how much they've paid into the system. So, you know, the head of Amazon is going to get more from SSDI than I would. With SSDI, there is a five month waiting period. So once the Social Security Administration says, yes, that person has a disability and the disability began on this date, they have to wait five months before they get start getting any cash benefits. There are some opportunities for back pay and retroactive pay depending on when somebody applies and how long it takes the Social Security Administration to look at their application, but there is no way at least in the context of cancer, to eliminate that five-month waiting period. That is a huge source of confusion for a lot of people. And frankly, it doesn't make a lot of sense because here we're talking about people who have disabilities so severe they cannot work and we're telling them, okay, but wait five months before you get your benefits. There are currently efforts in Congress to eliminate this five month waiting period so that benefits would start right away. Once someone has been receiving SSDI for 24 months, then they would have access to Medicare for their health insurance. This is another challenge with our system because what are people doing for those 24 months for health insurance? It is quite challenging in this situation, and there are also efforts to try to at least reduce the number of months that someone would have to wait for SSDI benefits. Now, something else about Social Security and disability insurance is that about 70% of applications are denied on the first try. So you may be working with people who have applied and gotten a denial. Just like with health insurance, we can't take no for an answer. There are five levels of appeal, and the first one is actually pretty easy. You're basically asking for a redetermination, and you're sending it back to the Social Security Administration and saying, no, this is really why I'm eligible. Definitely successful appeals require the help of the healthcare team because it's the healthcare team that's going to help people document not only their medical condition, but how the medical condition is impacting their ability to work. Because really, that's all the Social Security Administration cares about. Like with everything else, more information and more in-depth information about disability insurance and appeals on the website. But I wanna come back to this puzzle piece analogy I started with. Meet Jane. Her doctor suggested that she consider, quote, going out on disability, but she has three weeks of vacation and three weeks of sick time. Her employer is covered by the FMLA and offers a short-term disability insurance policy that lasts up to 12 months. So what are Jane's options? So first, she can take 12 weeks of FMLA leave to protect her job. But remember, that's unpaid. So what's she going to do to pay her bills? She can also take her sick time for three weeks and her vacation time for three weeks that's going to pay her at 100% of her salary. 
And then she can take short-term disability for the remaining six weeks that's going to pay her a percentage of her salary. So the FMLA provides the job protection and the health insurance protection, whereas the vacation, the sick time, and the short-term disability is providing the money. Certainly, she could use all of these benefits separately, but by using them all together, she's giving herself the greatest amount of benefits while also protecting herself. If she were just to take her sick time or her vacation time, she could be let go during that time frame. Again, it's the FMLA that provides the job protection. Now, Mark has three weeks of vacation, three weeks of sick time, his employer is covered by the FMLA, and his employer offers a short-term disability policy. But Mark needs to be out for 15 weeks. So starting here on the money side, he can take his three weeks of sick time, his three weeks of vacation time, and then his short-term disability for the remainder of the time. On the job protection side, again, we're gonna start with the FMLA, but the FMLA is only a max of 12 weeks. So what can Mark do to access an additional three weeks of job protected leave. Does anyone have any thoughts? Go ahead and throw it in the chat box if you do. Oh, it takes a second to type, so I'm gonna just wait one more minute. So what Mark can actually do is go back to his employer and say, I know I've exhausted my 12 weeks of FMLA, but now as a reasonable accommodation, I'm asking for an additional three weeks of leave. So here we've actually used all of the benefits that I've talked about today together to give him access to the time off that he needs that is job protected, while also maintaining at least a portion of his income. So with that and our remaining time together, I just wanna tell you a little bit more about Triage Health and how we organize the information so that you can use it after today. On both websites, we organize the information by topic. So if you were to go to the health insurance topic page, you would see all the different types of resources from quick guides to guides to animated videos on health insurance there. We also know though that uh, not everything on triage health is translated into Spanish yet. We are working on it, so bear with us. But there is another tool that we created in partnership with Pfizer. This is a non-branded tool. Anyone can use it and it's not cancer specific, but it's a website that is interactive and covers the topics of health insurance, medical bills, and employment and disability insurance. So this is just another tool that can be useful as you are out in the community, community and the Spanish version of this website will be live very shortly if it isn't already. We have educational events that you are welcome to join us for. We have our triage cancer conferences that are open to anybody, including community members, patients, uh, caregivers. Uh, we just did our last one for this year, but we'll be releasing our 2024 dates shortly. And we also have a training specifically for healthcare professionals and advocates. And I should have said this earlier, but when I talk about healthcare professionals, we use the broadest definition possible. So oftentimes it is nurses, social workers, navigators, financial counselors, um, staff from community organizations, community health workers, all are welcome. 
We provide continuing education to a number of professions. We are working on being able to provide uh, continuing education to community health workers. But as you likely know, it is very tricky because state to state, the rules are very different. But if you join us and you would like a general certificate of attendance, we absolutely will provide that for you. And then you can submit that to any relevant agencies that you need to submit that to. This insurance and finance intensive does a deep dive into health insurance, employment, and disability insurance. It's an all-day training. We are offering it virtually one more time this year on November 8th. Uh, registration is still open for this, and we mail out materials prior to the event. So if you go to triagecancer.org slash intensive, you'll see the registration form, and you can join us. We host this about eight times a year, both in person and virtually. So if you can't make November 8th, stay tuned and we will put out our 2024 schedule very soon. And then just a reminder that we want to be helpful. And so uh, sometimes, even with all the resources that we've created, people still have specific questions we are happy to try to answer those questions. So the topics that we most often talk to people about are around health insurance, employment, and disability insurance. We also talk about finances and estate planning. We don't provide financial assistance. It's just not what we do as an organization. But what we try to do is get to the heart of why someone needs the financial assistance. So can we help them get a better health insurance policy? Or can we help them navigate staying at work or accessing disability insurance? And we do that by educating. So we give them the information that they need. We explain the various options. We try to provide them with the next steps that they need to take. All that you need to do is fill out a form on our website, then if someone gives us their email address, they'll get a link in their email to schedule a call with us. This program is available in English and Spanish. We have a Spanish-speaking staff attorney, and our form is in Spanish as well. For individuals that utilize or that speak other languages, we do utilize a language line uh, to try to make that the most effective communication possible. You can certainly refer the people you are working with to the navigation program, but we also know sometimes people just don't have the capacity. So if it's better for you to reach out to us and we can talk to you about the situation and give you the information that then you can relay to your community, we can do that as well. So I wanna leave a couple of minutes for questions. So I certainly hope that you will stay connected to us. You can do that in a number of ways. Uh, signing up for our newsletter. We do once a month where we uh, announce upcoming events or new resources. We also ship hard copies of all most of our materials in both English and Spanish for free around the country. So you can come to our website at this material request form, let us know what you're interested in, and we will ship that out to you. Also, we are in the process of gathering some data from community health workers around these topics, around what are your community members coming to you with questions about and how comfortable do you feel answering those questions? Uh, we're gathering this data for a number of reasons and we know that you all are so incredibly busy and you've already taken time out of your day to come today. So we're incentivizing uh, participation in this needs assessment by filling out the survey, you will be entered into a chance to win one of four $50 Visa gift cards. So I'm going to leave this QR code up here for a little while, um, but also certainly if there are questions, um, I'm just, there are no questions. Um, so I don't know if that means I bored you all to death or that I explained everything per perfectly. Um, but we've got seven more minutes if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask. Um, so yes, uh, triagecancer.org uh, is what houses right now our charts of state laws and we have information for all 50 states um, and DC and some, and some territories as well.
Well, thank you all very much for your uh, kind words in the chat box. I am delighted to be here and have the opportunity to chat with all of you um, and really do appreciate the time that you took to be here today. And thank you to ASU for the invitation. And thank you, Monica, for joining us and sharing all this knowledge and information you have on a on a complicated topic, but you really broke it down and made things easier to understand. So we really appreciate sharing the time and space with you today.